Okay, finishing up chapter five, we're in key issue four. Why do people preserve local languages? Language diversity. We're going to look at some examples through multilingual states, states with more than one language. One of the first ones we look at is Belgium, where you've got the Walloons that speak French, and they're in the south, and you've got the Flemings that speak Flemish in the north. The Walloons, they dominate the economy and politics because they use French, the official language, and it's kind of all-encompassing. And even though they're in the south here, here's Brussels, their main capital, they speak French there. And so French is kind of the way through their language that they dominate everything. Um, because Brussels, it uses both languages, but it's still French, which is the main language. And actually in the capital, they have to use signs for both languages. But this is a, this is a state of controversy to some extent. It's a developed state, and you're not going to see like fighting or anything, but um, it's kind of um, an underlying tone of um, where people are against each other because they're vying for power through their language. So this is a state where it doesn't necessarily work out. As opposed to Switzerland, where they have lots of language diversity, but they peacefully exist with multiple languages because they utilize a decentralized government where local authorities have power. So there's not just one location where everybody is concerned about getting their language in and getting all the power. They decentralize it, meaning they, they send it out to different regions, different uh, places where people can have control over their own affairs, and it's not all dependent on one language, one situation, one area. Their four official languages in, in Switzerland are German, French, Italian, and Romance. Language diversity. We're looking at Nigeria, another example. The situation in Nigeria is different than Switzerland because we have 520 distinct languages. They've got Hausa, Yorba, Igbu, and those are the three main ones. You have lots of issues and tension because people can't communicate they're all vying for power, and language actually becomes a barrier instead of something that unifies. Um, and it's not, again, a uh, developed country. They're still having issues with infrastructure, and so language becomes one more reason that separates. Isolated languages. These are languages that are unrelated to any other, and they're not in a language family. Examples are Bosque. This is currently spoken by 666 thousand people in the Pyrenees Mountains between Spain and France in northern Spain. Um, and it's isolated. So the people, they haven't had to interact with other languages over time. They just remain the same. So they're not related to any other uh, language family. Of course, they're interacting with people nowadays, but as it developed, they were pretty isolated. Here's an example of them protesting with their signs there. Icelandic, you think about Iceland way up there in the northern Atlantic Ocean. It's part of Europe, but it's really isolated. For over 1,000 years, it's not changed very much because they've been on their own, and they haven't had outside influences. And Koro Aka, they've discovered 1,000 speakers in northeastern India. They, it is not really related, related to any other language family, so this is an independent, isolated language. Extinct and revived languages. Extinct language is a language that, that was used but it's no longer spoken. Examples of that. Native Americans. How many Native American languages have been extinct? Early explorers uh, recorded over 500 languages, but now we only see about 92. Think about all of the Western Hemisphere, all of those native languages. A lot of those are now extinct because those peoples have been wiped out. Only a few remain. Gothic. This was widely spoken in Eastern and Northern Europe during the third century. But because you had outside influences come in and convert people to religions such as um, Christianity, and during that time they used mainly Latin, they wiped out the Gothic language. Hebrew. This was used all the way back as early as recorded history. Um, it was used in the Jewish Bible, but it became extinct and it wasn't used. Lots of those tribes and recordings were wiped out. But it was revived again in 1948 after World War II when the United Nations created the current state of Israel. And you had the champion of the current Hebrew language. His name was Eliezer ben Yehuda. And he had to create 4,000 new Hebrew words and bring it up to speed for the modern dictionary. And now Hebrew is the main language, official language of Israel, and it's spoken by lots of people again. Preserving endangered languages. 
Welsh is an example of an endangered language that's dying out. Although it was conquered by England in 1283, 611,000 people still speak Welsh. And you know where Wales is in, uh, in Great Britain area. Welsh is the official language of Wales. And the 1988 Education Act made it a must to be taught in schools. So Welsh, they continue to hang on to it. It's taught in schools, but it's a, it's a dying language. Or it's a very it's spoken by a smaller group of people than, than English, of course. Irish. In the Republic of Ireland, Irish Gaelic is spoken by 350,000 people on a daily basis, and 1.5 million people say they can speak it. They don't use it on a daily basis, but they say they can speak it. To continue this language, they began to broadcast on television stations in 1996, and it broadcast only in Irish. They even began to ban English signs to separate them from the English people because they're very proud of their heritage. They want to maintain Irish as a language. Breton, it's spoken by 250,000 people in Brittany, which is an isolated peninsula there, and they hang on to that language when it's dying out. Scottish, you think about Scottish, they speak English, but no, they have their own language too. Around 60,000 people speak it, including the famous Robert Burns poem, Auld Lang Syne. You know, it's the one that goes, should all acquaintance be forgot? Da, 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 da. Um, that's uh, the New Year's Eve song that we sing that nobody knows the words to. Well, part of that's because it was originally written in Scottish. Cornish is another example. It became extinct in 1777, but it was recorded by a historian, by the last native speaker. It was a lady. And one of the th things that she said on her last, one of the last recordings, that the historian wrote down was she said I will not speak English you ugly black toad and that became like a saying for the Cornish people and they, they started to bring it back because it's a way of standing against things in pop culture in, in, Engl in England who were trying to force everyone to be the same. It was revived in the 1920s and it's now taught in schools. The global dominance of English, let's think about it, almost everybody we know speaks English. It's more and more you can go anywhere and just speak English and, and get away with it and communicate with people. One of the most fundamental needs in a global society is a common language because as we're teaching each other, as we're communicating, as we're doing trade and business and politics, we need a language that we can all speak. More commonly, it tends to be English. This is facilitated by pop culture, science, and international trade. Think about it. Our TV goes across the globe. It's in English. Our clothing, um, how we communicate, how we trade, uh, the science that we're creating here, it's all English. And so as people across the globe get in with that, they learn English, and it's, it's all communicated in English. English is the official language of 57 countries. That's more than any other. One-third of the world lives in a country where English is the official language. Even if people don't necessarily speak it in that country, the official language is English. Lingua franca. Excuse me, lingua franca. This really coins the phrase of communication. A lingua franca is a national, international, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a language of international communication. Uh, this began back when the Arabs met up with people of Europe who they called the Franks because their language was simplified into communication that could go between each other and it was the language of the, Fr the Franks or lingua franca. English is a lingua franca. It's, a, it's easy communication between societies and different languages and cultures that everybody can use, um, and it's their common communication. Pidgin language. This is a simplified form of a language used to communicate with speakers of another language. So a lot of what we hear when we're, we're communicating between cultures is a pidgin language of English because it's very simplified, and it's uh, just the easiest way for people to communicate across different languages. Um, here's a look at English-speaking countries, and you can see that there's a, there's a lot of them. Okay, It doesn't encompass all of them, but if you think about the developed countries, we're speaking English. And of course, more and more, we're going to see all of these countries, their secondary language is going to be English. If you hear screaming again, it's the classroom next door. Again, I think they're very excited about language. They're, they're very excited about how I'm presenting it. Expansion diffusion of English. English was spread through the British Empire through relocation diffusion. People were moving, they're spreading the English language. But recently through expansion diffusion, 
It's no longer necessarily relocation diffusion. Now it's expansion diffusion where it catches on exponentially through two means. Number one, the diffusion of new vocabulary, spelling, and pronunciation. And number two, the fusing of English words with other languages. Specifically, we look at African American English where they used lots of words. The examples of two of those would be gumbo and jazz. Those were African American, African -American words. Now we use them in everyday American English. Uh, specifically, abonics. This is a dialect of English termed after African American vernacular English, where you have um, the use of double negatives and other simplified forms of the English language that are very specific to African Americans in some parts of the country. You also have Appalachian English, which is different pronunciation. You think about the Appalachians here. Um, you know, let's be stereotypical where you have people that are living in the woods and they're on their own. Well, some of the things that we might think of them saying would be, um, instead of saying hollow, they might say holler. Instead of saying creek, they might say crick. This is variations to the diffusion of English. English also diffuses to other languages. Well, we've got franglais, which is the combination of French and English. Some French are kind of upset about this because they want to maintain their prestigious, unique form of language, the French. There, you know, there is some concern about the diffusion of English into their language because words like cowboy, hamburger, jeans, t-shirt, weekend, weekend, parking, software, and spam, now this has become part of the everyday French language. Spanglish, the combination of Spanish and English, um, where you see Spanish people using uh, English words. For example, the English word shorts becomes chores in Spanish. Chores for shorts. Vacuum cleaner becomes vacuum cleaner in Spanish. Parking becomes parking. So it's the combination. It's the diffusion of English. It's going into their uh, language, but also it comes into our language as well. Where we're, we're using Spanish words, tacos, burritos, tor tortas. You know, these are now English words as well, used in everyday vernacular. Denglish, where we've got the fusing of German and English. Uh, German, D, Denglish, coming from the German word Dutch, Deutsch, excuse me, Deutsch. So that's the blend there. Where you see um, German people saying happy birthday, instead of their harsher sounding, um, Herzleichen Glockwuschen zum Gebustag. Like, I didn't say that right at all, but you get the idea. It just sounds happier and more uplifting maybe if you say happy birthday instead of these harsher German words so you start to see that blend and then Japanese Japanese play baseball nowadays so instead of saying baseball in English and Japanese they call it baseballu and knife is now naifu these are some of the variations as English has diffused to other languages Spanish and French in the United States and Canada Spanish speaking has become much more prevalent in the United States as we we have we have people immigrate to our country. Some states have made English the official language due to concern over the increasing use of Spanish, and some states have embraced it where they have signs that are made in both English and Spanish. This is a look at the percent of population that speaks Spanish at home, and obviously you can see the highest percentages in the areas where Spanish Latin American peoples are immigrating into the country. All right? Um, then we look at French speaking, speaking Canada. A fourth of the population in Canada speaks French, the other speaks English. Most of the French speakers are clustered in Quebec because traditionally this was the area that was col colonized by the French. Obviously they're going to speak French. This has been um, an area of contention, but more and more these days they're learning to embrace it as a unique aspect of Canadian culture. English on the internet. English further strengthened the dominance of English. I have no idea what I just said. The internet further strengthened the dominance of English because so much of it is in English. You think about it. The majority of the material on the internet is in English. Early users as it was developed were mostly English. Search engines for the most part and web addresses use English. You know, your domain names, it's in English. You don't type in www. you know, Spanish word or Japanese characters. You type in www meaning World Wide Web, that's English. And then even what you're saying is written in English. Uh, if you're going to look up education.com, that's in English. Okay? You're not going to see JapaneseCharacters.com. Um, so it's more English domination through the use of the Internet. Mandarin, however, 
in China continues to be on the rise and may down the line surpass English because most people in the world, excuse me, more people in the world than any other speak Mandarin. The problem is English is the most prevalent right now and you can see how the languages of speakers has risen on the internet but mostly we're still looking at English. That's the biggest one by far. Chinese coming up quickly. That's our look at the entirety of chapter 5.